Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 133 and 134, which read as follows. Ma wo ca parusang ganchi uta pati vade yutam dukhahi sarambha katha, katha pati danda puseyat puseyutam Sache nare ne re si atta nang kang so upahato yatha. E sapato sinimba nang saram bhote nuijati. Which translate roughly as Do not speak harshly to anyone. Having been spoken to, they may speak back to you. They may reply in kind. Dukkha hi sarambhakatha. Angry words are painful. Patidanda puse yutam. And you may be struck may come to blows, you may be struck as a result, or may be hit in return, may lead to violence perhaps. Satche nere siyatanang, if you can keep yourself still, kang so upahato yata, like a broken bell, or a broken gong, this is the way you will uh, attain Nibbāna. Sarambhote Nauvinjati. And there will be no anger found in you. So this has to do with harsh speech. And the origin story is relatively long compared to the, some of the stories recently. have been fairly short. Um, don't have to go into all the detail, but briefly to sum up, there was a monk called Kondadhana. And everywhere he went, he was followed by a, a, a vision of a woman. So, quite curious, wherever, whenever he would go for alms, people would see this woman following behind him. And they would say, here's a portion for you, and here's a portion for your lady friend. And he never saw this woman. He would turn around and see no woman. But everybody else saw this, this woman. And so word kind of got around. And the monks got upset. But it tells a story of how this happened. So in, in ancient, and the story is actually somewhat interesting. I mean, it's all quite fanciful. I mean, for, for a modern skeptical audience, I think there's a lot of uh, distrust to these sort of magical type tales. How could there be this woman? And, well, the story goes that uh, in the time of Buddha Digai, Digayu, one of the past Buddhas, so in, 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 in another age, in another universe perhaps, uh, why does it say Dighau or Kasaba? I don't know, Kasaba or Dighau, anyway. There were these two monks who were so close, uh, it was as though they were brothers. They would do everything together. They were the best of friends and the closest of companions, and so they would always come, come out and, and uh, come out together, go for their meals together, go to meetings together meditate together, that kind of thing. And it happens that there was an angel, a goddess, a, a, a female angel somehow, who uh, saw them and thought to herself, I wonder if there's a way that I can uh, split these two up. Listen carefully, this is uh, gives some insight into the true nature of, of, of the divine. You know, we always uh, many other religions worship or pray to or uh, expect 
protection from angelic beings, well, it's not always their in, inclination. So this, this, just on a whim, this angel thought, I wonder if I can split these two up. And so one day when, uh, when, uh, when they were walking in, along the highway or the forest, one of the monks uh, said, you know, hold on, I've got to go use, uh, go, how do you say, attend to the needs of nature, I think it says in the, in the English. He had to use, he had to pass water, he had to urinate. And uh, so he went off into the bushes, and as he was coming out, this angel appeared behind him uh, as a beautiful woman, half naked and adjusting her robe and and, her, and, and fixing her hair, uh, as if coming out of the bush uh, that the elder had just been, uh, been in. And the other monk saw this and immediately suspected the worst in the first monk, accused him of, uh, of, of uh, breaking the discipline, accused him of, of having intimate relations with the woman, and the, the mother monk denied it, of course, and they ended up completely splitting. And this monk went before the other monks and accused him, and all the monks, uh, you know, they interrogated this other monk who denied it all. And so they couldn't come to a decision over it, but it completely destroyed their friendship. Now this angel, uh, realized and, and began to feel the effects of how evil it was, the, the thing that she had done. She wasn't malicious, she was just somewhat uh, deluded and, and perhaps impetuous or uh, careless, uh, intoxicated perhaps in her powers and her, her, great, her own greatness. But she felt terribly guilty and so she went down and told the monk, the, the monk who had accused, the second monk who had accused the first monk, told him what she had done. And this monk believed her, but they say it didn't ever fix their, their friendship. They ended up uh, never becoming friends, fast friends again, because they didn't, they couldn't. It was like the first one felt uh, like he had, the other one had, uh, betrayed him by believing such a thing could be possible. So those two monks were reborn according to their karma. The goddess was born in hell uh, and suffered there for a period of an interval between two Buddhas, was born as a man and eventually became our protagonist or antagonist, our the name of this uh, story, namesake of this story, Kundadhana, uh, became a man, was born a boy and uh, grew up and became a monk, but everywhere he went this woman followed him. And so the monks were really upset about this and thought we've got to do something because everyone's starting to talk and they're going to think that uh, we, we let women women follow us around. This monk is going with a woman. So they went to Anatta Pindika, who's, who's the owner of the monastery, or the donor of the monastery. And they said, look, you have to kick this monk out. Really, I'm not sure why they would do this, because you know, the Buddha was there, but this, this, I've seen this happen before, where monks go to lay people trying to solve the monastic problems. Uh, but Anatta Pindika was having none of it. He said, well, isn't the Buddha, you know, isn't the, the Buddha in Savati? And he said, well, the Buddha will know what to do. He did nothing. So they went to Visaka, who was the, the other chief lay disciple. She also did nothing. So finally they went to the king for some reason. And uh, they told the king about this, that there was this monk who, uh, who had a woman following him around everywhere he went, and the king should do something about it. And the king, of course, being just an ordinary worldling, um, was taken by their words and went to the monastery and brought some men and surrounded this monk's hut and ordered him to come out. And the monk looked out and saw the king, and so he went 
and, uh, and the, 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 he came out, no, sorry, the elder came out, and uh, the king saw the, immediately saw that this, there, were, there was a woman behind this monk. And so the elder, when, when, when he saw the king, he went back in and sat on a seat, and when the king went in, didn't see the woman. And so he looked everywhere, he looked in, you know, under everything, in all corners of the room, up in the rafters, everywhere, couldn't find this woman. He said, where is she? Where is who? The woman. And this goes on, and, and eventually he figures out that it's just a, some kind of strange phantom phenomenon. And so he, uh, he says, you know, look, because he takes the monk out, sees the woman, brings the monk back in, doesn't see the woman, he says, it's not real. And so he tells the monk, he says, look, you're, you're always going to have this trouble if this keeps happening, so you come to my home for alms. You come to the royal palace for alms. And the other monks found out about this, and they were incensed. They said, you know, not only is this monk corrupt, but now the king is corrupt as well. And so they were bad-mouthing the king and bad-mouthing this monk. And uh, they told this, they came to this monk, and they said, well, so now you're the king's bastard, they said. And the monk, um, you know, fairly reasonably, although, although uh, wrongly, um, became incensed at these monks and, and uh, shot back at them, you're the ones who are corrupt, you're the bastards. You consort with women, you're the ones who have women. So they said all these things that weren't true. And these monks were shocked, and they went to see the Buddha, and they told the Buddha this. And the Buddha called this monk to him and asked him if it was true. And he said, yes, it's true. And said, why did you do that? Well, they, because they said these things to me. Well, but the Buddha said, but they were saying these things because of what they'd seen. Now, did you see them consorting with women? Did you, do you, you, know, do you see them? Uh, do, do, you, do you have any reason to say these things? He said, no, actually. Actually, I'm uh, I just made that all up, right? And the Buddha said, well, you know, for you, this, is, this bad thing has happened to you because of, of things you've done in your past life. It's something that you have to bear with. And so then he told this verse. He said, don't speak harshly. So. The story is interesting, and it provides a little bit of interesting context. And the general sort of philosophical uh, topic here is about misconception, and what sort of misconception is is important, and what sort is not. If you see uh, if, if these monks who saw this woman behind the monk, then they had no reason to doubt it, you know. Their, their claim that this man was being followed by a monk was wrong, but reasonable. Was, uh, on a, in an ultimate sense, on an ultimate level, it was, it was justified. But this is the, the monk's misunderstanding. Now, the monk's wrong. Uh, it doesn't even seem like a misunderstanding, it seems like he premeditated. His misunderstanding wasn't in terms of these other monks being bastards or, or being uh, followed around by women or associating with women. He knew that was not true. But it's still it's a misunderstanding, you see. But it's a deeper misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding that somehow saying these words, getting angry even, is somehow the right answer. That there's some benefit to these things. This is fairly important because Buddhism still considers all evil to come from misunderstanding. It's a, you don't just get angry. You get angry because you think somehow that it's good to get angry. You don't understand anger. It's crucial because our ordinary way of dealing with anger, is to, when, we, when we feel that it's wrong, is to suppress it. Same with greed. When you want something, the only way to deal with that is to suppress your urge. So we believe the anger is, is, is wrong in and of it. The, the root is the anger. It's not. The anger isn't the root problem. The greed isn't the root problem. The root problem is you don't understand greed. You don't understand anger. You don't understand the things that you're getting greedy and angry about. 
You know, when you want something, it's because you think it is stable, satisfying, controllable. When you dislike something, it's because you feel like you can, you, you can make it stable. You can change it to be stable, uh, satisfying, and controllable. And only when you see, when you see clearly, when you uh, come to see the truth about this, uh, because we don't really know about the, the other set of monks, whether they had a reaction to these things. So they had this experience where they saw this woman or they even heard about this woman following the monk around. Uh, it says they, they actually saw it. Um, but we don't know what their reaction was, if their reaction was, was, was neutral and, and objective, or whether their reaction was angry. Um, but it's reasonable, and, and their misunderstanding was only in an abstract sense, in terms of concepts. So the concepts, um, they got the concepts wrong. They, they thought this was a real woman, when in fact it was just a phantom woman. But in an ultimate sense, they were, they were saying it was factual. This monk appears to be followed around by a woman. And so how this relates in general to all of us, because I don't think these circumstances are all that common, um, but obviously the general circumstances of finding yourself being accused wrongfully, of find your, finding yourself being abused, finding yourself being uh, manipulated or taken advantage of, uh, finding yourself being uh, unfairly treated, now sometimes it's with reason, so sometimes uh, justified. Sometimes you really are being unfairly treated. Sometimes there's malicious intent, but sometimes there's not. And well, I mean, and, and whether there is or there isn't actually is not the, the important and uh, the most crucial aspect. I mean, if you know you're being wrongfully treated, uh, this monk should have, you know, he was fully in his right to say I'm not being followed by a woman, that's what he did in the beginning. You know, so it's not true, there is no woman. I've never consorted with a woman. Uh, it's just not true. And, and, but, um, I mean, the important point is you can't control uh, your, the, the results of your uh, situation. You can't always solve everything. And everyone, has experiences of misunderstanding, sometimes irreconcilable. Sometimes to the point that uh, people actually think you're a bad person, you know, in this, as in this case, when in fact you've done nothing wrong. Just because you didn't have a chance to clear your name. It's, it's, it, it does speak to the importance of you know, trying, to, trying to explain yourself. But in the end, you're, you're never going to fix everything. You can't fix uh, life. And so you're always going to be, it's just another situation where there's going to be the potential for suffering, where there's going to be an unpleasant uh, experience, an experience that has the potential for the arising of, of anger, of dislike, of aversion. And so this monk, of course, became terribly averse simply based on his, not on his misunderstanding of the situation, but on his misunderstanding of the right, uh, of the reality of the situation, and therefore the right response, or the, or the nature of reality. He didn't understand that getting anger was a bad thing. He didn't understand what, that others might, well, there will be results, there will be consequences. Dukkha hi, what does it say? Dukkahi Sarambhakata They're indeed angry words are unpleasant, are stressful, are suffering. Dukkha. And it might lead to blows even. The next verse is actually a sort of a generally good um, sort of Buddhist, I don't know what the word is, a saying or aphorism, is that the word? If you keep yourself silent as a broken gong, you have already reached. Already reached. I don't know about that. You reach. I don't think it's already. Oh, Patosi has passed. Yeah. Patosi. 
Asi, pato, asi. Hmm. Maybe. The Arahant keeps himself silent. Remember the story of this Arahant who was accused of stealing a ruby. I think we had this story already, right? And it turned out this bird had eaten it. But he wouldn't turn in the bird because he knew if he did, the bird would be killed. And he didn't want the, to be responsible for that bad karma. So he kept completely silent even as he was being tortured uh, as the thief as the suspect for the thief. Be silent as a broken gong. I mean, this is, it speaks to patience. I mean, be patient with samsara. There's, there's another story of this novice who had his eye poked out. And so he, all he did is cover his eye, and then when he went to go offer water to his teacher, who had poked his eye out, he offered with one hand. And the teacher asked, why are you offering with one hand? Well, my other hand's occupied. But he was an arahant as well, and so he also wasn't upset. And the arahant, the, the, the teacher was was uh, mortified, and he begged forgiveness. And the novice said, "It's not your fault, venerable sir. It's the fault of samsara." And again, this is the case with this story. Our situations are it's the best best answer is they're the fault of samsara. It's the way of the way things go. It's maybe not the way things had to go. They could have gone differently. But the point is that it's part, you know it's how samsara works. Sometimes misunderstandings arise. It's not always clear. It's not always pleasant. Unpleasantness can arise from many different things, from natural disasters, from human violence, and it can arise from simple misunderstandings. You might call it a sort of structural violence where the structure, rather than the people, is a cause for suffering. And there's no one to blame for it, not directly. But uh, suffering is, is potentially inbuilt into the structure. So in terms of our meditation, we try to just be mindful, rather than trying to fix things, because fixes are not uh, consistent, are not consistently uh, attainable. You can't con you can't uh, always fix your problems, and so trying to make that a solution is the wrong uh, path, the wrong the wrong way to be. Instead of trying to find solutions to our problems, we learn to unravel them and to just be with them. So just to stop seeing them as problems to see through the problems to the ultimate reality and to understand the experiences and the uh, objects of experience objectively without judgment, without partiality, without expectation. This is what we do throughout the meditation. We become like a broken gong that just sits there, doesn't ever ring, doesn't ever react, you know. If you ever rung a broken gong, it doesn't reverberate. Just like that, there's no anger, there's no reaction. When people, when people are nice to you, you don't become elated. When they, when they speak well of you, when they praise you, and when they accuse you, when they vilify you. This is like a gong that doesn't, no matter how you hit it, it doesn't reverberate. It's broken. So, that is our Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all the best.